One of the reasons that I understood what the Chinese Communist Party was doing was because the way that the B-2 goes to war is very similar. The B-2 is not invisible. In fact, it can be seen by radar. But it's very difficult to see when there's other things that are out there. And so, in many ways, it's deceptive. The Chinese Communist Party's method of warfare is right there in plain sight. In fact, many times they'll tell you exactly what they're doing. But often we're distracted and deceived. The deception of the CCP is monumental. I mean, I, not that I think I'm the greatest person, but I have a PhD in American history, I've taught history, I've taught the relationship diplomatically between the CCP and the United States. I lead perhaps the largest think tank in the world, right of center. And I was deceived. So I, I say that for people to understand, it's okay for you to admit that you were deceived by this because it comes from what I believe is the inherent goodness of Americans to give every people on earth, regardless of who they are, what they look like, the benefit of the doubt. And, and what I'm saying is that deception has been laid bare Over the past 200 years, America has been the beacon of freedom. It lights the way for those seeking human rights and freedom of faith. But we were kept in the dark, while this beacon was being severely eroded and sabotaged. And for half a century, America was looking the other way. Why are Americans completely unaware of the CCP's plot after more than 50 years? What are the timings chosen by the CCP to implement the different stages of its plan? If we want to truly confront the CCP threat, we have to go beneath its overt efforts and see its true colors. China has a, a sort of a, a binary strategy toward the United States. On one hand, um, it strategically uh, has a very stable continuity based upon its ideology, based upon the institutional incompatibility of the two countries. So that's very clear to the Chinese uh, core leadership. <laughs> they always view the United States as the ultimate rival, as the source of the biggest threat to the Chinese regime. That's continuity. There's also changes, there's also vari variations, and that comes to uh, mostly uh, to the point of timing. So at what point China should adopt an offensive position? At what point China uh, uh, could conduct a strategic withdrawal or retreat? That is basically based upon the specific timing and specific circumstance of the international situation. To achieve their 100-year goal of defeating America, the CCP has developed a master plan, a plan highly deceptive and complex. They call it Tao Guang Yang Hui. In the last several decades, the overall approach was what we call the Tao Guang Yang Hui, which basically is uh, hide our strength and bide our time. Let's just develop, get stronger, and, and then timing is not good for us to have a showdown with the United States. Their whole philosophy is based on lying. When they tell you they are weak, that's when you watch out. The phrase, hiding your strength and biding your time, is often attributed to former CCP leader Deng Xiaoping. But in fact, its origin traces back to Mao Zedong. Though overtly belligerent and anti-West on the surface, Mao was carefully laying the groundwork for his plan, hiding his strength and biding his time. We have been here a week. This was the week that changed the world. As we look back over this week, 
we think of the boundless hospitality that has been extended to all of us by our Chinese friends. With Chairman Mao, with the Prime Minister, and with others with whom we have met, our talks have been characterized by frankness, by honesty, by determination, and above all, by mutual respect. I think they started out very unfriendly in 1949, and they became much friendlier after 1972. We thought if we are nice to the Chinese Communist Party and nice to the Chinese people, they will regard us as a friend, and we can all be friends in this wonderful multinational universe we're creating. But let me point out to you that Deng Xiaoping and I were not naive or ignorant at that time. So we anticipated that in the future, there would be many differences between our two countries. But we also realized, I think accurately, that the things that bind us together for peace and progress are much more important than the things that, uh, that divide us one from another. But do we really know the hidden truth behind the CCP's strategy? What are the specific policies and scams? In 1997, when the CCP took Hong Kong from Britain, it promised to keep the city's open free market system, allowing them a high degree of autonomy. The Communist Party called this policy formula, One Country, Two Systems. For U.S. politicians, Beijing seemed open to embracing democratic values in its proclaimed territory. That's even more so in Taiwan. When Henry Kissinger met Mao at his residence in Beijing in the 70s, Mao made these claims about Taiwan. It's better to have Taiwan under the care of the United States now. I say that we can do without Taiwan for the time being and let it come after 100 years. This was one of the most deceptive promises ever made. We are very concerned uh, by the uh, PRC's provocative military uh, activity near Taiwan. Li there must be a peaceful resolution that respects the rights of the people of Hong Kong, as outlined in the 1984 Sino-British Joint Declaration. Hong Kong should be able to take the the Twenty nineteen. The world watched in shock the death of Hong Kong's freedom. I would describe now is the collapse of one country two system. This is the end of Hong Kong. This is the end of one country two system. Make no mistake about it. By now, it would be foolish to think communist China could follow the same playbook and deceive the people of Taiwan. However, the free world failed to see through another game the CCP has long played. Reform and opening up.
What American corporate financial and political elites have found out is that they've been duped. For 30 years they've been duped. In 1978, the CCP launched economic reforms. Then after 1997, financial and technical aid from the United States and Europe flooded into China. The Chinese regime became an unofficial ally of America. A stabilizing fact. In 2001, with its full support of the Clinton administration, China officially joined the World Trade Organization. The ministerial conference so agrees. the West opened its doors to the CCP, and communist China rose from it, becoming the world's largest manufacturing powerhouse. We allowed them to ascend to the WTO in 2001, uh, a little early. We allowed the Yuan to be part of the, the IMF's uh, SDR way too early but they didn't live up to any of the uh, fundamental listing requirements. When Clinton, the Clinton administration, agreed to let China into the World, World Trade Organization, which surrendered the most favored nation clause that we had been using, uh, there were people who said this is going to be a disaster because you, will let, you have let China in under modified rules. In other words, it doesn't have to behave by the same rules as the other members of the World Trade Organization. And the Clinton administration said, oh, don't worry about it. This is, and this is an exact quote, uh, this will be a poison pill for China. And the exact opposite happened. Instead of ending the trade imbalance, the trade imbalance became much worse, which it continues to be today. In the two decades after joining the World Trade Organization, communist China ushered in a golden age of economic boom, an era where America's manufacturing sector crumbled. No matter where you're doing business around the globe, the factory floor is in China. The fact is that we have been bleeding manufacturing jobs in, in the whole country. We went from almost 20 million jobs back in 2000 to 12.3 million today. How did it happen? What traps did we fall into when dealing with the CCP? And what false hopes were we given? The CCP chose to privatize its companies and to join the WTO. But there's a reason behind it. And that is, nearly all state-owned firms were collapsing. And they were dragging down the banks with them. The CCP had no other choice but to turn all state-owned firms into private companies, and then give the ownership of these companies to the officials. A set of data we uncovered revealed what the CCP had tried hard to keep from U.S. political elites. These statistics came from an article titled, Saving State-Owned Banks. In July 1997, China's four major state-owned banks were in deep crisis. Bank losses became an open secret. At the end of 1999, the four major state-owned banks had a total of about 3.2 trillion yuan of non-performing loans. The CCP's public ownership of enterprises was a total failure, with the banking system on the verge of collapse. In state-owned firms, tens of millions of employees lost their jobs. In fear of losing power, the Communist Party once again rewrote its history by covering up the failure of the socialist economic system. The CCP branded itself as an open-minded regime willing to abide by the rules of the global market and eventually cheated its way into the U.S. and Western market. At this time, the U.S. thinks Look how great the Chinese Communist Party is. They have already privatized their economic sector. They have already achieved a market economy. 
so we can let them join the WTO. This is really a socialist system masquerading as a capitalist system. And the reason for that is that all of the Chinese companies that uh, pretend to be independent or semi-private are in fact controlled by the Communist Party of China. You know, so for the last 20 or 30 years, the communist strategy since Deng Xiaoping is to be friendly to America, to invite in American investment, to build up the economy. Let's make money together. Americans not understanding Marxism, not understanding communism, believed that because China was going back to business, that China was inviting foreign investment, they must be abandoning their communist goals. The vast majority of people in the West who study the Chinese economy and Chinese politics have made the same mistake. They believe that the CCP will embrace democracy when it embraces the market economy. We all know that from Deng Xiaoping's Tiananmen crackdown to Jiang Zemin's crackdown on Falun Gong to Xi Jinping's suppression of Hong Kong today and how he deprives freedom of speech and freedom of the press, you can see that the CCP's hostility to freedom and democracy has always been consistent. I read my father's inside report after Deng Xiaoping visited the U.S. Deng Xiaoping made it very clear. The reason we open our door, open our market to the U.S., just we want their money. We want to be a strong country. And then to finally realize our goal in the, the east wind. <laughs> eventually blow off the waste wind. The CCP's secret weapon, capitalist money, is the lifeblood of the communist regime. The CCP gave the world an illusion that it was on its way to capitalism, that it was just following an alternative path to Western capitalism. But in reality, the CCP's market economy is just a means. The end is to save the Communist Party and communism. It has nothing to do with capitalism, much less democracy. The longer we allow the CCP to stay on this track, the greater the threat to the United States. The CCP has the best bait for the world. China's 1.4 billion population and its huge market. For foreign businesses, it was an offer they couldn't refuse. Give us your technology and we allow you into the playground. But what these foreign companies did not expect, in order to operate in China, these companies were required to form joint ventures with local companies and were forced to share their sensitive private technology. Forced technology transfer helped the communist regime build up its own brands. And these brands started to capture and monopolize the domestic market. Next, with the price advantages and state subsidies, the Chinese brands flooded into the international market, directly challenging and squeezing out established international manufacturers. I mean, what they're using right now is basically they're inviting foreign companies in so they can take their money, take their technology, and get rid of them when they at the first opportunity, which is what I think is happening to Tesla right now. It's been very difficult for American businesses. They have been put under onerous restrictions when they operate in China. Oftentimes, they are required to turn over valuable proprietary information as a requirement for doing business in China. They're also restricted from removing money from China, from taking capital out of China. In 
the past 20 years, America's painstaking effort to help China enter the world stage. The beautiful history we wrote together. To promote democracy and the rule of law inside the country have all been for naught. But the Chinese regime has swallowed up all the benefits. U.S. public and private equity investments in Chinese and Hong Kong domiciled companies totaled by our estimates at Commerce $2.3 trillion in market value holdings at the end of 2020. In December 2001, when China officially joined the World Trade Organization, its GDP was $1.34 trillion, accounting for 4% of the world's GDP. 20 years later, in 2021, China's GDP was $17.7 trillion, accounting for 18% of the world's GDP. These figures tell the story of how China's national power came to be. It was all a scam. It was all a lie. It was all designed to get massive American money to weaken American anti-communist resolve and to build the Chinese military and Chinese power to the point that they could challenge America. This has been a great deception on the part of the Chinese Communist Party. And that basically China right now uh, has exploited uh, American openness, American friendship, and is ultimately working to bring about the defeat and ultimate destruction of the United States. There's been many movies where character is seen killing an animal, hunting for food. And when they get to the animal, they gently caress the animal and they say, thank you for giving your life so that I can survive. So we are giving of our life's blood so that the Chinese Communist Party can survive and thrive. Throughout its 100-year history, this is how the CCP has survived every existential crisis. To quickly alter its face and to lure the world into one false hope after another. Thanks to Western investment, the Chinese regime is now much stronger than it once was. But instead of pushing for political reforms as it promised, the CCP is using this strength to bite the hand that once fed it. It has begun to unveil the other side of its master plan against the United States. To infiltrate, divide, and subvert American society. So the biggest problem that we have had so far in dealing with China is the fact that China is fully integrated with the Western free market system. So they could take advantage of the open society. And that, to me, is the biggest danger. And this involves every man, woman, and child, and not the military. It is not targeted at the military. It's targeted at families. So we have to become comfortable with the term warfare under our own roofs in our companies, under our own roofs in our homes. We have to all understand we are at war. If you thought the Cold War was bad, just put a thousand X on the Cold War. Now you have unrestricted hybrid warfare.